Okay, hi everybody. I'm Gerard Lobskachny and welcome to Zulu Alpha Firearms Channel. On today's episode, if you ever thought to yourself, is being a collector mean that you have to be over 65 years of age, that you have to own a Zimmer frame, and that your favorite pastime is discussing with your buddies about the time you were fighting in the trenches of World War II with your favorite muzzled load of firearm, then this is the episode for you. Because we're going to be dispelling some of those myths and also asking some frequently asked questions and probably correcting a lot of my incorrect historical references. And to do so, we have the benefit today of speaking to advocate John Welch, uh, who is a, a very distinguished advocate of many years of experience and also a gun enthusiast. He is also, in, if I must say, the president of the South African Gun Owners Association, or SAGA as it's known. He's also the current president of the Pretoria Arms and Ammunition Association. And more importantly why he is here today is because he's a national chairman of the National Arms and Ammunition Collectors Confederation of South Africa. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you to be here. Very nice to be here. So perhaps we can just start off. What is the actual purpose of collectors associations and then we can move into the more the nitty-gritty about how do people actually become collectors? Yes we can deal with that. Uh, since the advent of the Firearms Control Act, when it came into operation in uh, 2004, a decision was taken in that particular law that uh, if a person wants to be a collector of firearms, that person must belong to an accredited collector's association. Previously, that was not a position. Under the old Arms and Ammunition Act of 1969, a person could, since 1988, be a bona fide collector, like a person could also be a bona fide hunter or bona fide sportsman. Now, the new act, the Firearms Control Act, uh, culminated all of that and declared that there must be associations. So, Section 17 of the Firearms Control Act provides for collecting of firearms and Section 18 provides for collecting of ammunition mm. by private people. Now, what is important about collectors associations, first of all, is that a collector must belong to an accredited collectors association. That meant, originally, that all collectors associations, incidentally, there are 15 currently of them in South Africa, all of those collectors associations had to apply for accreditation from the South African Police Service at the Central Firearms Registry. That meant that collectors associations had to go through a number of uh, elements, I would say, in terms of which they had to comply with the requirements. For instance, a collector's association, first of all, need to have a formal structure. A formal structure in the sense that there must be processes in place in terms of which a person who applies to become a collector of firearms can uh, apply and the process must be there in terms of which that person is then evaluated whether that person is in fact a collector of firearms and or ammunition. So basically a, st a standardized procedure. There is a standardized procedure throughout the country and all accredited associations had to comply with exactly that. So for instance, a dedicated procedure in terms of which uh, potential uh, collectors could then apply to become a collector and your collectors association would have this tick list in terms of which they can say yes this person is a collector or no that person is not a collector. Now what it actually means is that a person cannot merely gather firearms. Mm. Uh, in the past if a person had a number of firearms, be sort of regarded him or herself as a collector. Currently, that is not a position. So a person currently must in fact have a field of interest or a theme which sort of guides his or her collection. So in other words, a person can say, I'm interested in Anglo-Boer War 
firearms or I'm interested in World War II firearms or Korean firearms. And if that person has a motivation why that person wants to collect those type of firearms, once that person has been declared such a collector, that person can be declared as such. That person remains a person in good standing with the association. In other words, that person complies with the spirit of the legislation and that person also then complies with the requirements of the Act. So in other words, the uh, associations have got a huge say in the matter as to what the person must do in order to be compliant. Mm. For instance, they may say, I would like you to obtain five points, collector's points, during the year. And that, would, that may mean that the person must pay his subscription fees. It may mean that that person may participate in the activities of the association, either practical activities or theoretical activities. It may mean that the person may write articles for the newsletter of that magazine uh, or anything that the association feel is appropriate for a collector. So, so your participation isn't necessarily just actually getting firearms. You could be a collector and technically speaking attend the meetings, um, like you say, write articles, show other interests in particular fields, fields of firearms. You, and quite yeah. correct. Quite, that, is, that is quite correct. At the Pretoria Arms and Ammunition Association, for instance, which was the first association to, be, to receive accreditation, we indicated over there when I was uh, chairman of the association, we indicated there that the person could write articles, the person could attend practical activities, in other words, where shooting events would take place with the collector's firearms, or the person could present a paper uh, either at a lecture event where we refer to it as a theoretical event where the person learns more, people learn more about uh, firearms and collectibles and so forth. So there are a number of events that a person could participate in in order to remain a person in good standing of a particular association. So of course that makes me now curious and I'm asking for a friend, would that include making YouTube videos about firearms? That certainly would count a point for me. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, uh, I've already paid my subscription fees, I've already signed my declaration that I'm still a person in good standing, uh, I've already written articles for our newsletter, uh, I've participated in the international events of the collector's associations, I do this particular video which would also count uh, another point and so forth and so on. So uh, a person can do a lot of things. We in fact go that far. If a person visits a museum where that person has an intent interest in the particular firearms, that even may count as a point to become a person in good standing of the organization. So in essence the associations are a mechanism for I suppose checking with you have a genuine interest in collecting, that you're not a chance who just wants to hoard firearms for whatever reasons. And they're the ones that actually vet you and determine, yes, you are actually, in our, by our standards, a collector and actually not the police that make that determination. That is a very good observation. Um, when we originally argued the legislation in Parliament, uh, and we can do a lot of talking about that because we were not uh, prepared to merely accept the legislation as it was. We, we made various presentations to Parliament in this regard and we indicated that a collector's association should be the board of experts, should be the, the core experts in this group because the police are not experts in this field. So we indicated that the, the collector's association, because they are accredited, they have a good standing with the Central Firearms Registry and for that reason they take the decision as to what is collectible and what is not and also who is a collector and who is not. And I think that is a very important point because the law stipulates that the chairman of the Collectors Association must establish whether the person has an interest in and a knowledge of 
particular firearms. It must also indicate that chairman must also indicate it must also indicate as to what the person's field of interest or his theme in collecting is. So the, the Collectors Association in fact play a vital role in this regard uh, and for that reason the chairman certifies that the person is a collector, he certifies that the firearm is a collectible and he certifies that the person is in fact a person in good standing with the association. And I think that is of great importance. Your hunters association or your sport shooting association, their chairman also play a very important role. They would for instance say the firearm is suitable for the particular event that the sport shooter or the hunter applies for. Whereas the chairman of the Collectors Association in fact certifies that it is a collectible. So his, 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 his certification is of very great importance to make sure that that person remains or is and remains a collector what the category of collection is and also that the firearm is collectible. So we kind of touched on it indirectly but so let's say I'm interested in becoming a collector um, and I for example uh, am interested in um, firearms used by the South African police between 1950 and 2000 and that's kind of my area of special interest. Yes. I approach whichever association of my choice, there's 15, yes. Yes. Um, and I say to them, hi, I'm interested. Kind of what would be the standard things that I would go through up until the point where they say, we accredit you as a uh, collector? I think the first question that we would usually ask is, why do you consider yourself to be a collector? Or why do you want to be a collector? Because we must distinguish between the two. Some people had firearms before the time, but they were not necessarily collectors. Uh, many people had an interest in firearms, that, but they were also not collectors. Some people who approach us have not had any firearms at all. Um, and then the question is, why do you consider yourself to be a collector. And I think in that regard, the person must then convince that panel of experts, including the chairman or delegated person by the chairman, as to why he or she wants to be a collector. And I think the importance in that regard is the mere fact that you are fond of firearms, the mere fact that you like firearms, the mere fact that you have an interest of firearms, that is insufficient. You must not prove to me that you have an, affin uh, 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 an affinity for firearms, you must prove to me that you are in fact a collector. And I think that is the importance. Of and, and, and wrapped into that would be me expressing what my themes are. Because like you said, I can't just say I want to collect firearms, I have to kind of have one or more specific themes as I understand. The law stipulates that there must, uh, must be an agreement between the applicant, the potential collector and the organization as to what the field of interest and or themes are. So in other words, you may come to the association and you may say, let's use the example, uh, you are interested in police firearms from 1951 to 1960 or to 2000 or whatever the case may be. I would like to ask you then as to, but why do you have an interest in firearms of a police era? You would tell me, but I'm an ex-policeman, and for that reason I have an interest in these firearms. Then I would say to you usually, let us test your knowledge. Tell me a little bit about firearms used by the police over that particular period that you have shown an interest in. And you would tell me, but the police started off with Webley revolvers, they started off with the old Smith & Wesson uh, revolver, uh, they thereafter moved to a Walther P P38 for instance, they thereafter moved to Beretta M92 or Z88 uh, vector or something of that nature and you would tell me a little bit about your knowledge in that regard. I would thereafter test in more detail. I would for instance ask you, but the detectives, 
what type of firearm mm. in your experience did detect detectives use? And you would tell me a Walther PPK in 7.65 caliber, for instance. And I would know that would be the right answer because at one stage in the history of the police, a Walther PPK was the issue firearms for detectives. Later on, that changed. And you may possibly even tell me that. But then you would tell me, but I would also be interested in, for instance, the Uzi, a submachine gun that the police used, and before that they used the Walther uh, submachine gun. And I would ask then tell you, but look, you must remember, those were automatic firearms, not so. Uh, and you would tell me, but I'm not interested in the automatic versions, I'm only interested in the semi-automatic versions of those firearms. And I would then tell you, but if you want to become a collector, your entry level may never be restricted firearms. A restricted firearm is a semi-automatic firearm, whereas a prohibited firearm is in fact a fully automatic firearm. But, but, you, but you can never enter the field of collecting by becoming a restricted firearm uh, a collector, which is category B. And that will probably get us to the various categories to which I will get now. So we will then say, but fine, can we then agree that your field of interest will be police firearms from a certain date to a certain date, ordinary firearms only? In other words, not semi-automatic rifles, not semi-automatic shotguns, non -full auto fully automatic weapons of that nature. We can then agree in that regard. So, you, so first step is the themes that we all have to agree on. You have to confer that I am sort of Correct. Yes, have a genuine interest. I must test your knowledge yeah. and your, your, your interest in that. So that is what I'm doing. That is what we are doing as a panel when you appear before the committee. And once we have done that, we will then declare you a collector, category C collector, for instance. Is that the bottom you, level, category C, starting point? The, the, I'll get to the categories just now, but we'll, we'll start off with the category C collector and uh, we will then say to you, but this is your field of interest and we're going to stipulate the field of interest and we're going to issue a certificate of collectability for you. And we are going to declare you then a category C collector. Your field of interest is going to be police firearms uh, from, let's say, 1950 to 2000 and uh, we are going to declare you then a member of that particular association. And also if I understand it, you, you would take that particular certificate which classifies you as A, B or C, whatever the case may be, and you would use that to go get a competency from the police. That is in fact quite correct because what we are going to do, that certificate of collectability is going to be part of your documentation that you're going to eventually submit to the police. Now we'll get to the competency certificate just now because there is a dedicated collector's competency certificate as well. So in other words, you would do your ordinary testing from a service provider. The service provider would test you with regards to whatever firearms you have an interest in. And that may be handguns, that may be shotguns, that may be rifles. It may in fact be self-loading uh, rifles and shotguns as well. That would basically cover all four types of firearms. And that's the same competence that anybody else would do if they wanted to purchase one of those types of firearms. It's not, not different at that point it's, in time. It's not, at that stage, it is not different at all. It remains exactly the same. But what is very important, you are now going to inform the police that you would like to have a competency certificate for collecting purposes. So that will be on For top. instance, category Charlie. Yeah. So when you apply for your competency certificate, from the South African Police Service, you're going to say, fill in the ordinary form, you're going to attach your proficiency certificates that you have obtained from your service provider, and you're going to attach the certificate of collectability, proving that you are in fact a collector in category Charlie. This is who you are, and this is what your field of interest is, and the police will then accordingly issue with a competency certificate. And would that be the standard sort of credit card size certificate mm -hmm. that other people would have for their normal competencies Quite for correct. pistols? And, yeah. 
quite correct, excepting that on your competency certificate, there will also be the inscription category C. Okay. All right. And then just quickly in a bit more detail, the, the different categories, you kind of did touch on it. What exactly does C allow you to do, the yes. B, and what the B allows you to do more, and A, B, A is the top category as I understand. That's quite correct. You have four categories in terms of the law, category Delta, Charlie, Bravo, and Alpha. Category Delta, D, is the entry level. We managed to get that included in the Firearms Control Amendment Act of a few years ago. And in terms of that category, that is basically for the person who has started as a collector. The person is not quite sure as to which sort of way he or she wants to go to. He may possess one or two firearms at that stage. He's not quite certain as to which direction he is going to go. So we give him on an opportunity uh, to collect up to six firearms. Mm. So under category Delta, you can only collect up to a maximum of six firearms, which must be ordinary firearms. And by then you must sort of decide which way you want to go. Okay. So a person may say, let's start, uh, let, let's use the police example again. Uh, the person may say, I'm interested in police firearms. Uh, so he starts off and he obtains a Walther PPK, uh, he obtains a, a Walther P P38, he obtains a Smith & Wesson Victory model or whatever the case may be. And thereafter he decides, but I'm really interested in police firearms. Then he can apply for an upgrade to category Charlie. Now he can collect limitless number of firearms, but under category Charlie, he can collect only ordinary firearms. In other words, not semi-automatic firearms, not fully automatic firearms. So, so, so D and C really is the number of firearms really that differs between D and C. Quite correct. Delta and Charlie is only the, the only difference is that Delta is an entry level. It limits you to a maximum of six firearms. You must remember an ordinary person may not collect, may not possess more than four firearms. So under a collector category Delta, he may collect up to a maximum of six firearms. Thereafter, he or she may apply for an upgrade to category Charlie, which is now limitless, but it does not include semi-automatic rifles, semi-automatic shotguns, or any fully automatic fire. Now those six on, on Delta, would that include his self-defense pistol that he, that he already might have, for example, or would yeah. that be six collector firearms? It's six collector firearms. So I could have my self-defense plus six, in other words, totaling seven. You may in fact have more. Okay. You may have two hunting rifles. Okay. You may have a hunting shotgun. You may have a self-defense firearm in terms of section 13. And then you may have six collectible okay. firearms. And then uh, Charlie will be unlimited within your scope of, of themes. Within the field of interest yeah. or themes. Okay. And then category Bravo would be, would include semi-automatic firearms or self-loading firearms as we prefer to say. Now that is not a, a pistol because a pistol is also self-loading but we are only talking on under Bravo as uh, restricted firearms, your rifles and shotguns. And then under category A, that is almost, that is the ultimate. Uh, for the person who has an interest in yeah. that. Obviously, there are many people who are not interested in automatic weapons at all. So it's not a natural progression it, for everybody? Not at all, yeah. Yeah. not at all. So because what I was looking at category A, um, which as you said is restricted firearms, I mean that's quite a, that's quite a serious list. That's a, category A, sorry, is a prohibited firearm. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, a miniature cannon. Um, I read somewhere else it's, you know, it's fully automatic uh, potentially. It even speaks of, um, I think, a rocket propel Indeed. grenade. I mean, it's a, it's a huge, very serious category of, of types of firearm that fall under the, the A. Yes, there are um, many very serious items that fall under category A. You must just remember that as far as all projects, uh, uh, projectiles and launches are concerned, they must uh, be deactivated. Yeah. So in other words, you may not possess an M26 hand grenade, for instance. You may possess the body, 
but it must be deactivated. There must not be any explosive material in it. There must not be a priming com component in it. So that must be deactivated. And there must in fact be a certificate by the chief, uh, chief inspector of explosives that it has been deactivated. Also the rocket launcher, mm -hmm. the launching pad of let's say an RPG-7 grenade. Uh, the, 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 the launcher itself, uh, although that need not be deactivated, no projectile mm. may be fired from that. So I'm not going to be shooting off RPGs on a category, Definitely on a category A. Definitely right. not. But the fully automatic weapons would be functional. A fully automatic weapon could be functional. So there are quite a number of category A collectors in South Africa, when I say quite a number, it's less than 1.5% of all the collectors. There are approximately, as I've indicated earlier on, there are 15 collectors associations that have been accredited. Those 15 collectors associations have 2,150 individual private collectors. We are not talking about public collectors yep. now. So they are private collectors. Of those 2,000, let's say 100 private collectors, 1.5%, slightly less, are category A. Mm. So in other words, your category A collectors are very serious collectors. Uh, first of all, they pro probably have the funds to collect, to, to purchase those weapons. They do have the safekeeping facilities to mm. safe, safely keep those firearms. and. Uh, when they fire those firearms, they only fire it at exceptional mm -hmm. events, uh, or otherwise they would display it uh, 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 whilst complying with the requirements of the law. And that's not going to happen overnight that you're going to be a Category A. I mean, that's probably a couple of years to get to that it's, level? It's a number of years, generally not less than five years after you have become a private collector, and you must really show that you have that knowledge and that interest before a private collector's association is mm -hmm. going to accredit you to be a, a Category A collector. So obviously if people want to know more about these, they should contact the associations to get more in-depth knowledge. We're just kind of giving the overall look as to yeah. how this works for people who might be interested and just want to know about it. There are some frequent on questions that I want to fire off uh, as sort of towards the end of this, this, this episode. Um, things that I've heard that really didn't make sense that people told me and I wanted to just confirm yes or no in your opinion. As a private collector, if I'm not displaying my weapons, do I need to keep the firearm and the ammunition separate? The answer generally is uh, true. The law stipulates that, um, that firearms may not be loaded, mm. but there is one exception as far as collectors are concerned. If a private collector does not possess a self-defense firearm, he may have, he or she may have one of the collectibles loaded okay. for defensive purposes. But otherwise, firearms may not be loaded, excepting that one firearm. Your self-defense firearm, self firearm obviously may be loaded, and the ammunition must be separate to that particular firearm. The law stipulates that ammunition must also be kept in a prescribed safe, so it must be in a safe. Does that mean a separate safe to the firearms? Not necessarily, okay. it may be the same safe. Right, great. Can I take my collective licensed firearms to the range and shoot them? Subsection 4 of Section 17 of the Firearms Control Act stipulate that a firearm a licensed under this particular section may be used where it is safe and where it is lawful. So you can take your collectible firearms to a shooting range, it can be safely fired over there. Brilliant. Do I need a walk-in safe if, my, if I am a firearms collector? That will basically depend on the quantity of firearms in your collection. A person with an, a fairly small collect, uh, uh, number of collectibles can use an ordinary uh, safe, whereas your, perp, your people with uh, generally uh, Category A firearms or a large number of firearms, you would find in the majority of cases they have walk-in walk safes. safes. Okay. Um, do collector licensed firearms have to be deactivated? No, definitely not. Uh, we have been fighting that for many years. Uh, Originally, the law stipulated that uh, collectibles need to be deactivated. We oppose that vehemently, and we shall continue to oppose that. Uh, so currently, the situation is that no fire collectible firearms need to be deactivated. Advocate John Welsh, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. 
Thank you, everybody. I hope you walk away from this with understanding a little bit better about what collectors associations are, what a collector is, and how the process actually works. We want to give a big shout out to where we are today. We are at the War Store in Parkwood in Johannesburg, very close to the Rosebank Mall. Definitely a fascinating place if you're interested in war memorabilia. They also have a very strong online presence. If you go look at www.thewarstore.co.za and you can speak to Alan or Roxanne and they will gladly help you find whatever it is you're looking for. I'm Jared Labaskakni, Fazula Alpha Firearms. Be safe, be legal, and be responsible.